So what I was hoping to talk about today is something that I read in a recent book called Mirror World. Um, the notion of a mirror world is, is something in a Neil, uh, sorry, in a William Gibson book called Pattern Recognition, and it's this idea of technologies converging and things being similar but different. I think that's happening in the web with the, the combination of gaming and web product development. I think an example of it is that so many examples today are, are video games, whether it's Moshi Monsters or whether it's Lemmings from back in the day, that these things and the way that we build these things are increasingly similar to the, the way we build and the way we think about web products. Uh, so much so that it, it's really a blur between the two, and that's what the term mirror world means. And so in terms of why this topic, I think that as a result of these two worlds combining, that there's an increasingly a new source for each of us to learn about the other. So, so the concept of mirror world is, uh, as an example, if you look at technology 10, 20 years ago in Japan, and you compare it to the stuff that you use here in the UK or in the United States, you totally wouldn't recognize it. You wouldn't be able to figure out how to use a vending machine. Uh, you would be extremely confused by how the toilets work. It's almost like they developed a parallel set of technology to accomplish the same needs that we have, but they did it entirely in their own way. And so it's a really cool book, Pattern Recognition. It talks about how confusing that is. But as an American living in London, or as a, a Brit, if you ever go to America, you, you'll see similar things, but the technology is a lot more understandable. I know what a cab is, even though yours are nicer, but I get the concept. It's very easy for me to use. Uh, I don't understand why you've got you know, both the washer and the dryer in a single thing, and I really don't understand why it's in my kitchen. <laughs> but it works, and it's very recognizable to an American this is where games have come from. Games 20 years ago was Japan technology. A person, uh, or even 10 years ago, building a, a web product would never think about talking to a guy who was working on a PlayStation 1 game. And today, these things are incredibly similar. So we've gone from being like Japan and the West to being like the UK and England. Uh, just a few examples to prove my point. First of all, everyone talks about gamification, gamification. I'm not a big fan of the world, of the term, but it, it's, the point here is the web is realizing that games offer something called a game mechanic, which is a core compulsion loop, a way of getting somebody to want to do something that makes them want to do more of it. And clearly this comes from the video game world. On the other hand, if you read the popular press or TechCrunch about video gaming, the whole topic is how do we learn to operate our games like services, w which is a silly question to a group of web product managers because you've always operated web products as services since day one. And so these two groups are suddenly sort of blinking at one another and realizing that we're doing the same thing. Uh, and I think lastly, an important reason that web folks should learn from the world of gaming has to do with new product development. So with video games, there are goals, you achieve those goals, the game ends, people stop playing the game and they go to new games. And what it's created is an industry that for the last 25 years has had to constantly make new products. Whereas Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg will work on Facebook for the rest of their lives, sure they'll add new features, it's one product. In gaming, we talk about cadence and we talk about slate. And what we mean is sort of a, an ingrown sense that our own products are eventually going to fail from the very moment we start our companies. And that means that somebody who's been in game development can launch new products every year, in fact has to, sometimes working on simultaneous products. Which means that they're very advanced on how to fail fast, and failing fast is something that this crowd is very interested in. So, I thought it was an interesting uh, thought exercise to just talk about what a game is. And I admit, I, I couldn't have just created the answer on myself because I've worked in gaming for a while. I had to look it up on Wikipedia and places like that. But it was fun. Uh, so first of all, a game means that you're not obligated to play, uh, which I think makes the, the notion of uh, what they call mandatory fun at work very explanatory, right? You, you go to these exercises at work, it's like, hey, we're gonna do a team builder, guys, because we're cool and we're Zappos and we're gonna high five. And, and I, need you to, I need you to go run around and I need you to do a, you know, a scavenger hunt. You need to come back here. And if you ever wonder why those things aren't fun, this is why, because you have to do them. And of course, the, the grandest experiment of all in this is, is the book and the movie Hunger Games, right? Obviously, it's not a game. I mean, it's, it's guys that have to kill each other. So first of all, you're not obligated to play these things. And I think like a lot of modern web services, you're not offering needs anymore. You're offering wants. And when you traverse from offering a need to offering a want, the, the barrier, the hurdle you have to get over to get somebody to come back really goes up. Next, games are unproductive. And, and I mean unproductive in, in the, the uh, economic sense of the term. I, I might win all of Tom Holmes' marbles, but I took the marbles from Tom, right? We didn't walk out of the marble game with any more marbles. 
Uh, and so from purely an economic standpoint, games are not helping our, our GDP in that sense. But in another sense, they really are. Uh, what they are productive at doing is helping people learn, having people imagine. They evoke emotions, and I think that what games are possibly best at is allowing people to learn. And there's, there's a reason why children and of all species play games. It's because games are one of the best ways to learn, despite the fact that you're very unproductive doing it. Games always have an uncertain outcome. That one's sort of a no-brainer. Uh, it's sort of life is a box of chocolates type of a reference. Games have rules, and people need to know what those rules are. Uh, I, I see a lot of people getting into gaming, and they're building mobile games, and they haven't done that before, but maybe they're an analytical person, maybe they've got a web background, and they tend to make things that don't have rules or that the rules aren't clearly stated. And without understanding the rules, it's really hard to play any game. Games are fictitious. Uh, and again, I think this is a huge learning in that we always have to create these virtual worlds. You know, there's uh, really a lot of, of, of the nerds around here, certainly me, always have grown up with that thought, what if our entire life is a giant game, right? You know that matrix sort of thought that you admit you've had, I know you have. And, and, and really the reason you have is if you look at this list, and I'll add a last one, a game has goals, you can quickly see that the only one of these that's different than life, I would argue, is the fictitious bit. Life is a game in a lot of ways, except that it's the real deal and you only get to play once. And so again, gaming is very much mirroring what we do in the real world. So in terms of games, uh, gaming is a medium like, like paint or like making a movie. And to understand the world of games appropriately, you need to realize that there's at least two ways of applying this paint to canvas. And, and you'll meet game developers of, of the one ink and another of the other, and they constantly fight with each other. Like movies, some people make movies to express themselves and to achieve some sort of high understanding of themselves, to express a the thought they've got. And we call these people artists. And this is what artists do in any medium. And art is really good. And games now provide an amazing canvas for art because of all these things. You can create entire worlds. You can create experiences that didn't exist. You can have people run through simulations. It's an amazing interactive art experience. Uh, but artists don't really care about the end user. And again, we could, we could mock that as, as product folks and say you've got to focus on what the user wants, but artists don't need to do that. That's not what they're in for. There are some commercial artists who want to sell paintings, but the true artist is really trying to capture an expression. If people happen to like it, great. If they don't, that's fine too. And then they're entertainers. And I would say the movie equivalent would be the sort of stuff you see at Sundance versus Jerry Bruckheimer, right? And the, the Sundance folks we call indie games. And this is a movie that came out relatively recently about these folks. And, and the artists are indie, or the indie gamers are artists, right? And they're very frustrated with the Jerry Bruckheimers of the gaming world. Uh, and the Jerry Bruckheimers of the gaming world, yes, it includes Zynga, but it includes a lot of others as well. Uh, Electronic Arts, Activision, any game that's trying to be commercially viable. And I'd argue that it's not purely about games wanting to make money, uh, although it happens and you see what the slippery slope of that looks like. Rather, it's about wanting to impact as many people as possible. An entertainer, a comedian, probably didn't choose to be a comedian uh, out of personal desire for wealth. On the other hand, that comedian or, or that rock star, that, that entertainer gets jazzed by being in a massive stadium full of people because they know that as many people as possible are experiencing their products. And in this sense, the other type of games and the kind that I'm interested in, the kind that I think is relevant for, for product management discussions is games as entertainment. Our goal is to impact as many people as possible by making our games as widely played as possible and as impactful as possible. And we think that games truly are purposeful and that they're really fun, and, and fun is a good thing, and the ability to imagine and create is a good thing. But if you wonder why you sometimes read about the indie gamer arguing about selling out, it's the same stuff you see in movies. It's basically Sundance versus Jerry Bruckheimer. Both are okay, and they should just realize how each other is different. In terms of product development and gaming, there's four quick examples I want to give. There's no unifying theory here. I just thought these were four things that that uh, folks can learn from the, the world of gaming. The first is a quick story from the console wars. Gaming did not start with Facebook as much as it seems that way in these conferences. There's a lot to be learned about what has happened in gaming before. And in fact, if some of the folks making mobile games or making social games would read a little more history on their own industry, they'd realize that they are walking into traps and opportunities that others have walked into in previous decades. I want to talk about two models for developing a successful video game and, and point out how similar these models are going to be to, to the customer discovery process in the web startup world. Talk a little bit about the role of analytics in game development. 
and finally talk about the role of the product manager in gaming. It's a role that didn't exist in gaming until the, the web came along with online games. Really until social games, this role didn't exist at all. So first of all, a quick parable from the, the history of the console game wars. Uh, the, the console was the first time games really went mass market. And I'm talking about PlayStation, Nintendo, Xbox. These devices brought relatively high quality games to everyone. You needed to own a television, you needed to own a relatively affordable box, you bought a game on a disc, you put it in the console and you could play. And the first of these consoles, and, and of the, the mass popular ones, launched in 1994 with the PlayStation 1. If you're an Xbox fanboy, that's cool, it's the same story. Just uh, bear with me here. And then six years later, the PlayStation 2 launched, and six years later, the PlayStation 3 launched. With each successive generation of these boxes, the capability uh, that the box offered the game developer radically increased. So if you imagine the, the file size of the game, the processor speed, all of these things was going exponentially upward in these boxes. File size is a pretty good proxy for the rest of the thing. A game went from being 500 megabytes large to being a gigabyte large. Uh, it went then to being eight gigabytes. Uh, in terms of the processor, it went exponentially up. And what happened is the graphics you could put on these games got so much better, the games could get so much longer that it required a lot more resources to make a game. So in AAA, what that term means is basically the high quality stuff you'd actually buy in a store. A team in 94 was 10 or 12 people. And by 2000, when the PS2 came out, it now took 20 or 30 people to make a game that was really up to snuff, a game that used and harnessed all the technology in that box. And by 2006, it took a team of 60 to 100 people. In 1994, you could make this game in about six months with that 10 people. In 2000, you could make it in about a year. And coming up to 2006, which is now the, the cycle we're at the late stages of, it takes about two years to make a game from scratch. There are exceptions, but effectively, you're talking about man months going from about 60 to about 1,400 to make a game in about 12 years. And at each step of the way, something happened. And it was a decision in some cases and a mistake in others. The development teams that were making the best PlayStation 1 games sometimes refused to grow up. And they were looking at the requirements of making the new kind of game, and they realized they had to hire these things the game world calls producers. Uh, these are basically managers who don't do anything, but they manage a lot of work, right? Uh, in some ways, like a product manager, in other ways not. And then they had to have more hierarchy, and they had to have processes, and they had to make tools. And some game companies said, I'm not interested in this stuff. It is not fun. I'm here to make games. I don't want to have the associate producer who works for the senior producer. I just want to make my game. And so they got off the train. Some other studios aspired to grow up, but couldn't figure out how. They struggled, and they struggled, and they, they threw the mythical man month at the problem, and it didn't work. And then finally, there's some studios that succeeded, and those are the ones that became PlayStation 2 studios. This process repeated again with the PS3. I think there's one big takeaway here. Uh, and that's within a context of a fact, which is this is going to happen again. This really happened on Facebook with Facebook gaming. The production values went up as people learned to harness Flash better. And it's going to happen on mobile. And the key thing to learn from this is just accept it as a fact and align your interests with it. So I can think of an example of a company, uh, my own, Playfish, which was very aligned with this picture. We did pretty well traversing up the Facebook equivalent of this graph. There came a time where we really had to wonder if we're really up for going for the big thing and hiring the thousands of people and bringing on the massive layers and becoming this massive company. And I think we opted not to, and I think our exit was very much aligned with our desires. Zynga, we can say a lot of bad things about them. They're, they're a $2 billion company. I think they were very aligned as well. And I think they really wanted to go for it. They shot for the moon and they succeeded. Uh, whether that sticks, we'll see. But there are a lot of, like, hundreds of social gaming companies in between that uh, were misaligned. They wanted to go big, like Crowdstar, but they didn't do the things to go big. Or they wanted to stay small, but they grew their team size up. So the important thing is to be aligned with yourself. The next one is about models for making games. There's effectively two models. There's one where you innovate and you come up with a new idea, and a second where you increment on top of an existing game or an existing platform. Again, if you've read Four Steps to Epiphany or read the Lean Startup stuff, this is going to sound incredibly familiar to any startup. And the important thing here is to know which camp you're in and to make decisions based on being in that camp. And to turn Google off. Um, basically, what you're doing in the innovative category is you're trying to create a new style of play. And there are a lot of theories of fun, but there's really no science. In fact, a lot of the guys and girls that succeed in this are the artists, and they accidentally find out, but they don't commercialize their success. So a lot of times, the art camp will find the new gameplay mechanic. 
In terms of categories, there's a, an extremely small number of games that do this. For example, uh, Wolfenstein was really credited with making the first first-person shooter. Uh, guitar Hero is credited with coming up with the idea of playing a game with guitar, but it's actually based on Guitar Freaks, a game you haven't heard of. And Sims, I put up here because I used to make a Sims game, is credited with making a people game, but there's another game called Little Computer People that technically was the first to do it. So there's a question, who's really being innovative? On incrementing, it's about making an existing game better or bringing it to a new audience. And I think one of the most viable plays as a startup is a new platform comes along and you race to take a thing that you know works well, be it a game or a web product, and put it on that new platform. Uh, and I think uh, examples of that are Halo. They said, hey, first person shooters are great and I think we could play one on a, a console controller. And we've all heard of Halo now. Farmville, same story. There's this farm game, uh, but it could be so much better if they really understood the mechanics of how to make a game. So they made it a lot better and it did really well. In terms of innovate, a couple things. Do have a creative designer. A creative designer is a person in the, the game world that really knows how to make something fun. Prototype your core game loop. The core game loop is sort of that compulsion in your, in your product uh, to go rescue, you know, take Mario Brothers. It would be to get to the end of the level to try and get the princess, to realize the princess is another tower, and then to go find another tower, right? And rinse and repeat. It's a core compulsion loop. And this is the thing you want to test. And you can strip out every other part of game when you test a game. You can strip out all of the, the meta game. You can strip out all of the extra stuff and the social features and the Facebook integration. And all you have to do is prototype this. And in fact, you can even prototype it by making a paper board game. Uh, so one of the things I've seen done most successfully is we make a paper version of the game we want to play and you can make it in about two hours and you sit around a table and you play the game. And if it's fun, you're onto something. And if it's not, you're not. And there's a step up from that. You just do a bunch of client code and you plan on throwing that code away and you can crank out a new prototype every two weeks. And you can do that for two months. And at the end of the result, you've got eight games and you can make the one that was the most fun. And then test versus ask. People could look at a game and say, oh, that's not fun, or look at it and say, that's great. But they don't know what they're talking about. None of us do. So you have to actually get playable things in the hands of people and fail fast. You know this story. Everyone's talking about it. This one's really important. Clone yourself. Uh, Playfish, we came up with the first isometric tycoon game on Facebook, at least the first one that was really popular, Restaurant City. And the world was our oyster. The game got huge. It's really the genre that's still the most successful one on Facebook today. But we were creative folks and innovative folks, and we said, all right, we've conquered this. We're moving on to the next challenge. And meanwhile, other people made the nightclub city, other people made the airport city, other people made the restaurant this and the hotel that. And uh, we had an opportunity to fast follow ourselves, but we, we stuck to the path of innovation, which I think we could have chosen to do both. In terms of don'ts, don't build for technology's sake. I, I don't want to jump too far into the HTML5 fray, but uh, this idea that players want to play an HTML5 game, players can't spell HTML5. So... <laughs> You, the question is, can you make a game that's good? And if you can, and then that technology lets you make it on more platforms, that's great. But until a day comes when you can make a good game on the thing, and somebody will do it, people don't care about your technology. They never will. Uh, in the gaming world, look, it's not just HTML5, it's always Unity. Unity, Unity, Unity. People want fun experiences, and they don't really care as much about graphics as you think. Don't make it complicated. Just do one thing. Don't spend two years in a vacuum with your wonderful game, and then be heartbroken when it doesn't work. And don't defocus. So again, these are classic startup stories. The gaming world has learned them independently and it's only now that we're realizing it. You see a lot of game studios because of the slate nature of our business working on five products at once. A team of 10 people should be working on one product, just one. And that product should have one core game loop, not two. So in terms of incrementing then, this is the other style of game. This is where you've got either a game that you know works and you want to put it on a new platform or you've got a game but you think you can make it better. The most important thing is to really understand the thing that you're improving upon to apply science to the art, because a lot of times it is the artists that figure out the first original idea, but they don't really understand why the game is working. And on the flip side, there are a lot of examples of people trying to deconstruct something successful and failing. Draw something is this game you play on, on your mobile phone. You've probably played it. It's wildly successful. And there have been 100 clones of Draw Something. And I think one of the reasons that so few of them have been successful is so few really understand the core passback mechanic, the idea of both that we're playing cooperatively and that we need each other. They don't understand it. And so you really need to deconstruct using science and data what it is you want to make better if you want to make it better. You should have more resources. Look, if you're in the business of making something somebody else makes, uh, there's an analogy that, that pops up both in Steve Blank's book about customer discovery and in the US Marine Corps. Steve Blank's book says you need three times as many resources to outdo somebody at something they already do well. And the US Marine Corps says if you want to attack a beach, you need three times as many soldiers as the guys on the beach. 
It's the exact same concept. If you want to do something they already do, you have to triple the effort to get it done well. Disruption comes in where you try and do something differently instead of attacking head on. And be innovative within your feature set. So just because you're incrementing on a game doesn't mean you can add a, can't add a new feature. In terms of the don'ts, yeah, you need lots of resources, but don't staff a team too quickly. The, the best way to design a game is with three or four people. The best way to make a game is with many more than that. So don't staff up the team until the core group of people has really figured out what you want to make. Uh, don't make two games in one. We made a mistake with this game Pirates Ahoy on Facebook where we made an island management game and an Etsy adventure game. We should have just made an Etsy adventure game or an island management game, but for lack of making two, one game we made two and, and the two didn't work together. Different audiences liked each and the entire thing failed. Don't over farm your game. Uh, there is a pun in here. My point is you can't make Guitar Heroes every six months and you can't make new Farmville games every three months and yet that's exactly what happened and it's why we all got tired of playing Guitar Hero games and it's why we're all getting tired of playing Facebook games is because we're over harvesting the golden goose. So if you're onto a good thing, don't over milk it. A good little story here, and before I, I'll try and wrap up after that. This plane in, in uh, black and white is a, a Soviet plane in the 1960s. It, it's called an IL-38, and it's designed to find submarines. And they built it because the US built this thing called a P-3, which is this modern one in color, a uh, modern version of it. And they didn't know what this tail on the back was, but they knew that the US had this anti-submarine plane. <laughs> we need it. And the US one has a thing in the back. We need a thing in the back. By the way, this is somewhat legendary, so if, if anyone has designed P3s, and I'm wrong, apologies, but I'm pretty sure the story is true. So through various Cold War adventures, we get our hands on one of these IL-38 Russian planes one day, right? And we open up the tail, and it's empty. Except in the US plane, there's this really fancy sensor in there called a magnetic anomaly detector that sees submarines. So they, they tried to copy the idea without understanding it. And, and this is where analytics comes in. Understand the thing you're copying, it's not just about how it looks, it's about how it functions. So analytics should not be used to make games. And I think if Zynga goes wrong anywhere, or if a lot of mobile game developers, sort of that first wave of guys who made really quick games, uh, if they went wrong anywhere, is they thought that analytics could make games. And you meet a lot of individuals in the valley right now going around, and it's, it's two guys, and they're really good at A-B testing, but they have no product sense whatsoever. And the reason is because they, they misunderstood. Analytics tempers them. It's like that guy in the forge that makes it steal. But if you just start with analytics and you have no creative underpinning, there's nothing to forge. There's no iron ingot. Uh, so here's some examples of where analytics are good. Measuring interest. They're testing the logo or the name to make a game. Uh, the game we're coming out with, we're comparing it to our future competitors who don't know we're competitors yet. We've tested their name and people are one third as likely to click on the name of their game as ours. So, and that's because they just threw names out there without analyzing them. Those are quick wins where you can temper iron into steel. Here are a couple other examples as well. Mainly, you can't polish a turd. There's just nothing you can do to a turd, so you should ditch it and go try something else. So then what's a game product manager? Because we didn't used to have these roles. Some people say it goes like this. A game designer is good, and a game product manager is evil. And so that's where we started, and there was a lot of hatred of people who were scientific or analytical or cared about making money in games. And then it sort of evolved to something a little better, and it was something like this. Game designers make the game fun, but product managers have to make it deliver metrics. Dollars are one of them, but it could be retention or acquisition as well. And that was a much better answer, and then the two could start to work together. One focused on making it fun and enjoyable, the other on making it commercially viable. And I think where we're settling out on this, and I think this is a lesson for the game industry itself, because we're still struggling with this role, is that there's supposed to be a Venn diagram that doesn't show up very well, but the Venn diagram basically has three things, creative design, technical project management, and analysis. And there are roles for each of these circles, the producer for the project management, the game designer for the creative bit, and for the analyst, a business analyst. And, and you don't have to fit an individual to one circle. So if you find somebody who's really creative, but they're also good at analytics, hire that person. And if you find someone who can do all three, promote them. But all of these roles should be accomplished within your gaming company or your web product management company because you need all three. And so what project, or rather product management is, I think is some combination of these three roles and it's all built around the team you've got to make sure that all three roles are covered. In terms of wrapping it up, I guess a few conclusions. Uh, first, games in the web are now mirror worlds. They're no longer alien technology and that means that we should be cross-hiring and cross-learning and I think you see that well in effect in, in conferences like this. Second is that most successful games are incremental. But most, uh, when I say incremental games, it's different than copying. Incremental actually means you have to improve it. it. It's a really tough business to purely clone because it's all about resources. 
Uh, next, if you're a startup, you should probably be focusing on mobile. It's not a rule, but I say that because I, I'm reminding myself back to the PS1 to PS2 to PS3 story. And it's sort of like that movie, The 300. The reason they're in that, that hot gates, as they call it, is because the numbers of their enemy don't matter, right? You know, it, that's the same idea. On mobile, you can compete with the big boys because all their numbers in the world won't help and you can be quick. And that's typically why startups exist on new platforms and mobile is the new platform of the future. Uh, creativity and analytics, they work best when balanced with each other. They, they tend to cause trouble in isolation. And I think the most important thing that's not really said anywhere in this presentation but merits saying anyway is, is the most important thing is to just go do it. As somebody who's thought about starting a company for a long time before just finally doing it myself, the, the single hardest thing is to just have the courage to go try. So if you're thinking about doing a startup and wondering about all this stuff, I'd say the single hardest lesson is that you can't do it if you don't try. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.